Welcome everyone to another Lunch and Learn. I am super excited about today's presentation. Um, but before we get into our presentation, I want to throw it over to Therese to uh, tell us what's going on at the chamber. Therese, what do you got? Well, you know, Howard, we are so busy with so many events and thanks for putting it out on your email I saw come out this weekend. Um, so as you all know, we're a very active chamber and we have tons of event on, events on the calendar. You could go to monmouthregionalchamber.com to the events calendar to see it all if you want to register for anything. But just in a nutshell, I just sent out the email for next Next Wednesday, February 14th, we have our very first inaugural Zoom meeting for the Community Partners in Service um, group. They are brand new. We are we are now bringing our nonprofit members together with the for-profit uh, sector because we want to see how we can help each other. We uh, The nonprofit world and the for-profit world have things to offer each other, and so that's why we created this group. And next week, we have a Zoom meeting. And um, so we're going to talk about the um, the group and how it, and what our direction and our mission is. And then we have a speaker that's going to talk about some fundraising that's available for nonprofits that I might not be aware of. So that's going to be an important call uh, for everyone to hop on and listen to and join in in the conversation. Um, and we will be doing the round robin 30 second commercials afterwards. Um, so that's that. This um, and remember, every Friday we're at the Marlboro Diner at uh, around 730. Uh, till nine o'clock in person. If you want to have a delicious breakfast, come and join us there. And it's a great networking event. We had 31 people this past Friday, so it was really crowded and we loved it. Um, and it, the only thing is the last Friday, we do it on Zoom. So don't go to the diner on the last Friday. We do that meeting on Zoom for those people that can't get out there. Uh, and um, I guess that's, it. oh, and Chambercast, Heart Health Month this month. It's on Monday, the 26th. And uh, Chamber Cast is at Bellworks. We'd love to see you there in person. It doesn't cost anything. Great speakers. Dr. Pete, cardiolog an independent cardiologist, will be the speaker. And lots of great information to share. So you don't want to miss that. And that is in person at Bellworks on the 20, uh, 26, 8.30 a.m. till about 10. Awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much, Therese. So, Thank you. So February is National Cancer Prevention Month. And... Mm -hmm working with our great partners at Center State uh, Healthcare System. Today, we have Dr. Ishkovich, who's gonna be talking about high-risk cancer screening. Uh, but we are so proud and so privileged to have uh, the doctor uh, with us today to take us through this presentation. Um, I can tell you firsthand, you know, the devastating effects that cancer has certainly on my clients. I see it, you know, unfortunately, you know, stage four, whatever type of cancer they have is really tough. It hits the families really hard. Obviously, the people um, are affected and, you know, it's really tough to mm -hmm. see that happen, not only to the person, but but their loved ones. And unfortunately, in my business, I get to see that uh, far too often. So what I'm hoping that we can uh, get out of today's presentation is a little bit of, uh, of prevention, right? And a little bit of best practices of things that we can do to better protect ourselves, educate ourselves in terms of the risks and some of the screening opportunities that, um, the hospital may have for us. So I'm, I'm really excited to get this information and I'm really so thankful uh, for Dr. Ishkovich to take his time uh, to talk to us today. So please allow me to welcome uh, Dr. Ishkovich. Doctor, take it away. You're on mute, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be able to speak here. Um, I, I think, um, you know, high risk screening is something that is, you know, relatively new to uh, to the region. As Central State continues uh, its partnership uh, and to expand its partnership with Atlantic Health, one of the things that's really become an opportunity is to develop, you know, what, what are called tertiary level services uh, in the region. 
um, that allows us to really offer folks things that were not offered in the past. And high risk screening is one of them. So everybody knows, I think, in the community that you need to get your mammogram and then you need to go get your colonoscopy at age 45. Um, but there are other opportunities to screen that can prevent cancer in very specific patients. And, and that's actually what we're going to talk about. And it's an offering that Centra State now brings to the community that is, um, I think, unique and a big opportunity to save lives. I'm going to share my uh, my screen here. Uh, one moment. All right. Let's see. Um, is everybody able to see that? Perfect. All right. Perfect. All right. So. So today we're going to talk about high risk screening, and I, I'm going to just give you an overview so that I think uh, folks can understand, you know, wh what it is that we're talking about and what makes it different than than the standard screening. So several goals of our presentation: um, what is high risk screening? Um, how is high risk cancer screening different than general screening? Uh, what makes someone a candidate for high risk screening? Um, and then we'll talk about what are some examples of high risk screening. And uh, what should an individual do if they believe they are at increased risk? And I think these are really important questions to answer for, uh, you know, for uh, the folks in our community. Here it is. All right. So what is high-risk cancer screening? So high-risk screening is the process of identifying individuals who are at increased risk for cancer compared to the general population. So what, what does that really mean? So uh, for example, every uh, every uh, you know uh, woman that's born with two X chromosomes uh, will be at risk for breast cancer, and that breast cancer risk will be one in eight. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in my presentation. Um, but that's that's just inherent to the population. But there are certain women where that risk can go as high as sixty to ninety percent. Uh, and um, how do we identify those people who are at a particularly increased risk? And what do we do about that population, which is different than the general population? So um, a, um, an example of an individual risk that may be hereditary is some something like a uh, risk for pancreatic cancer, which we know to be familial in about 15% of cases. Um, other risks can be environmental risks, like, for example, smoking in the setting of lung cancer. So, so what is the difference between high-risk cancer screening and general cancer screening? So the general population has a baseline risk of cancer. So like we talked about, one in eight women will develop cancer. Uh, however, uh, the general population has a relatively low risk of developing lung cancer. But that's not the case if you smoke. If you smoke, that risk can go as high as, uh, you know, one in 220. So... Um, at that point, something should be done for that subset of the population that uh, and and that is what what high risk screening is. And in in those particular patients, we actually do uh, recommend low dose lung CTs every single year, uh, which is not recommended in the general population. So it can get confusing. And I, I, I think that, you know, we want to make sure that we are being very, very specific about what we're talking about here. So 12 and a half percent of women will develop breast cancer in, in the general population and should be screened with mammograms. However, a woman who is high risk is considered somebody who has a greater than 20 percent chance of lifetime risk. So that's different than the general woman. So the general woman has a 12 and a half percent risk, a high risk woman has a greater than 20% risk. Um, and that can be based on genetics, or that could also be based on some computer models that we perform at Center State for women who receive mammograms here, uh, specifically something called the Tyracusic model. Um, and women who are at greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer benefit not only from a yearly mammogram, but also the addition of a yearly MRI to that mammogram. Now, there are also women who have an overwhelming risk of breast cancer. Those are your women with BRCA, with the BRCA mutations or some other rare mutations like ATM. And those women have a sometimes as high as 90% lifetime risk of cancer. And those women benefit from prophylactic mastectomy, which again, we also offer at Central State. So this is uh, you know, high risk screening is really a range of diseases. It's not only a, um, you know, looking at uh, one particular disease, but it's a range within that disease as well. 
So what makes somebody a high risk candidate? Well, there's really two things. Um, uh, the first is the individual has a family history that predisposes them. That's one option. Um, the individual is carrying a genetic variant that has a known risk of developing cancer. So uh, it may be a family history, or it may be that they just happen to develop that when they were born, that particular genetic variant. And that can sometimes happen. Those could be what we're called sporadic cases. And then there's another possibility is that the individual has an environmental exposure that uh, increases their lifetime cancer risk, such as being exposed to radiation or being exposed to certain chemicals at work or smoking um, is another environmental risk that's very common. The important thing to realize is that um, an, individual an individual's risk, um, uh, although it could be elevated from the baseline population, does not necessarily mean that you, uh, that you need to screen. If your risk is relatively low above the baseline population, screening may not make sense. So, for example, you know, I, I'm often asked, well, you know, pancreatic cancer is so deadly. Why is it that we don't just screen everybody? Why don't we just, you know, do CAT scans or MRIs on everyone and, and make sure that they don't develop pancreatic cancer every year? And the answer is actually uh, because the risk benefit ratio doesn't make any sense. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, so let's say that we, you know, happen to, um, you know, find that uh, on a random MRI that somebody's pancreas uh, has a duct in there that's a little bit big. Let's say the normal is four millimeters and, and we happen to find that that duct is five millimeters. So now what we're going to end up doing is we're going to recommend an endoscopy for that person. And that person is going to maybe or may, maybe not uh, require a biopsy. And if their risk is relatively low, the chances are that's a benign finding. But if that same duct is enlarged in a population of patients where they've had two relatives with pancreatic cancer, that duct probably is going to represent something you know, more than just a, a subtle finding. And so we don't want to put people through the unnecessary endoscopies, the unnecessary CAT scans, the unnecessary MRIs, provide stress in their lives, unless that risk-benefit ratio really makes sense for that uh, direct individual. So why is cancer screening important? I think um, the most important part is finding cancer early improves survival. And um, below, I have a chart here of the median survival for, for pancreatic cancer by stage. So in screening programs, so if, if somebody is a candidate, for, a, for example, for a high-risk pancreatic screening program, we end up finding the pancreatic cancer in stage one or stage two about 80% of the time. Now, it's not perfect, but it's definitely better than uh, you know uh, the average population where 75% of pancreatic cancer is found at stage four. And if you look at the difference, you know, a stage one pancreatic cancer has a median survival of 25 months. Now, you may think that that's not that impressive, but at a stage four, their median survival is less than five months. So you really are making a dramatic impact on their survival by finding it earlier. And, you know, many of those patients will live greater than five years, um, you know, and last year in our high risk uh, pancreatic cancer screening program, we did find two stage one cancers which is a, uh, you know, a dramatic impact on those individuals. Um, so the other important part of it is, is that if we do find somebody who's at higher risk, it alerts the rest of their family that they need to be checked too. And it may be that, that the cancer doesn't develop in that individual, but it may develop in their uncle or their, or their niece or, or their sister or brother. And so it's important to have a family approach to, to these diseases because um, uh, that is what will save lives in our community. How is high-risk screening performed? So this is highly uh, individual risk and cancer specific. So for example, um, you know, one of the ways that we screen for colon cancer is we do a colonoscopy. And, and the general recommendation is that's done every five to 10 years. But uh, in certain high-risk individuals, that colonoscopy may need to be done yearly. And that is the method of screening in that particular disease. Um, other diseases, we screen with a combination of things. Um, so in general, uh, cancer screening is done through a variety of techniques. One of them is physical examination. So you know, a breast exam or a prostate exam, 
certain types of blood work. We do genetic testing and tumor markers. Um, we do imaging, uh, CAT scans, ultrasound, MRI, depending on the type of cancer. And in, in other situations uh, where things are a little bit more advanced, we uh, we do colonoscopy or endoscopy or surgical diagnostic procedures to, to screen. And then the most radical thing that happens is that when we know that somebody's at an exceedingly high risk, we remove the target organ in question. So for example, in BRCA, we would remove, uh, you know, we would do a bilateral mastectomy. Or for example, when somebody has a very rare CDH1 mutation, for gastric cancer, we actually remove the stomach prophylactically, surgically, because that person may have a 70% lifetime risk of developing gastric cancer. Um, so um, it, it, it's an entire spectrum of how we approach the problem. So who is at high risk? So broadly, it's divided into two categories, genetic predisposition, so either family history or um, environmental predisposition. So you know, uh, either your work environment or your, your you know, personal uh, decisions uh, have led to that increased risk, such as smoking or uh, other, envir uh, other environmental predispositions. And um, both of these uh, have different um, uh, screening programs that are available. So, for example, in the genetic predisposition arm, which I'll show you a little bit more about, we screen for a variety of cancers. Um, and then in the environmental predisposition arm, we also screen for a variety of cancers. So lung cancer is, you know, kind of the prototypical high risk screening, um, you know, where we, we offer it for smokers. Um, in the genetic predisposition arm, it actually gets quite complicated. And I'll, I'll go through that in a, in a second. So uh, here's some examples of high risk screening programs. Uh, so uh, a yearly lung CT in a patient with greater than a 20 pack year history of smoking. Um, a yearly MRI in patients with an extensive family history of pancreatic cancer. Um, biannual ultrasound in a patient with liver cirrhosis uh, to look for hepatocellular carcinoma, with their, which they're at risk for. Um, a yearly MRI in addition to yearly mammography in a woman who's at greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer. So um, I, I guess, you know, what I want to, the message that I want to bring here is that this is a very broad and applicable thing to a variety of diseases. So you really do need to contact your healthcare professional and have them uh, advise you on which screenings that you may be eligible for given your individual risk, because this is not one disease and many screenings are applicable to multiple diseases, as I will show you. So, um, the, the, the purpose of, of this slide is just to kind of illustrate a point um, where, you know, I just want to show you that it's complicated. And it's complicated because, for example, let's say hypothetically that we do genetic testing on somebody who comes in to see me because their brother had pancreatic cancer, which is kind of common. And we end up finding that that person has an ATM mutation, okay? That ATM mutation will now... Uh, tell that person that they are not only at increased risk of a pancreatic cancer, but also increased risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer and potentially prostate cancer. And that individual will then have to enter a screening program with multiple physicians monitoring each of their subspecialty areas to prevent that, that individual from developing cancer in that area. And it is through this kind of remarkable intervention that we can prevent cancers. You know, we had a, uh, you know, one of the stories that I tell uh, often, um, you know, is we had an individual who uh, was, uh, was found to have a, um, a breast cancer. And subsequently, uh, through uh, genetic testing, we identified a gene and, and then ended up having a colonoscopy and ended up finding a colon, colon cancer all in stage one. Uh, you know, a great opportunity where we were able to save that individual's life uh, by preventing two, two cancers that were actively there just because their family member had a genetic predisposition. So um, a CDH1 mutation is another example. You know, that person has an increased risk of breast cancer and an increased risk of gastric cancer. And the gastric cancer risk in that individual could be as high as 70% where we would be doing a removal of the st stomach and then 
uh, monitoring for, for the breast cancer in that individual. So the way that we do this at Centra State now is we have a highly coordinated effort among our uh, uh, screening program to monitor patients. And so if somebody comes in and let's say they have one of these mutations, we refer them into all of the high-risk screening programs that they need to attend based on the guidelines. And uh, each of those programs uh, gets coordinated through our genetics counselor and our team to be able to make sure that they're getting all of the screening requirements fulfilled and preventing as many of the, those possibilities. So the general message here is that um, when you when somebody has a positive gene, that does not only mean that they are predisposed to that individual cancer that their family member may or may not have had. That predisposition may uh, give them a risk for other cancers, which then also need to be monitored in the high risk uh, setting. So um, genetic testing is now a large part of, uh, of a high risk cancer screening program in familial cases. We have a very extensive genetic testing program at Centra State, uh, which we've built over the last two years. Um, and um, that program allows us to have, you know, very specific expertise in, in this particular area, which uh, not a lot of uh, centers offer in, in uh, the tri-state area. Um, and what's also important to understand is we're only scratching the surface of what's known about genetics nationally. You know, genetics, although we've known a lot and, and, and studied a lot in the last 20 years, we're only scratching the surface. We oftentimes receive uh, something called a VUS in our reports. A v VUS is something called a variant of unknown significance. So we will get a report uh, from a genetic testing company that we use, and it'll say, you know, your patient has a variant of unknown significance. And so what we then do is we monitor those variants, uh, you know, over the course of the years, and, and we inform those patients whether those variants end up becoming something benign or end up becoming something where then uh, an additional set of screening needs to be initiated based on those variants. Um, and the important thing, again, to realize, and I think the take-home point here, is that many inherited diseases involve multiple genes and how they interact. And so um, it's it's complicated, and it's very important that if you have a extensive family history of cancer, that you be evaluated by the right team who can give you, um, you know, suggestions on, you know, how you can potentially prevent some of these diseases and, and extend your life. So what should an individual do to determine if they are at increased risk? Well, um, so I think uh, what's important is that you need to, uh, you know, if, if you have a family history of an extensive family history of cancer, uh, it's important to discuss that with your primary care doctor. I think that's really the first step. And if that primary care doctor really feels that you would benefit from um, additional screening, um, then you know they will refer you into our high risk screening program, uh, depending on the site of disease that your family member may or may not have had. And I think the important thing to realize here is that just because you have a family history does not necessarily mean A, that you will develop the disease, and number two, does not necessarily mean that you will be benefited from screening. So um, a common, uh, you know, that's a, I think that's a common misconception. So I'll give you an example. So let's say a patient comes to me and they tell me that one of their first degree relatives, so that means a parent or a child or, or sibling, has had pancreatic cancer. Uh, it's very, very common for me to see a patient like that in a high-risk screening program. And they'll say, doc, does that mean I'm going to get it? And I'm going to say, absolutely not. Overwhelming chance, 97%, you will never develop pancreatic cancer. Uh, actually, the baseline risk of pancreatic cancer in the population is 1.6%. So 1.6% of all people uh, will develop pancreatic cancer. And having that family, single family relative only brings you to 3%. So in fact, if you do not have any genetic findings on the genetic testing, we will not screen you further, even though you have that one relative. And the answer is why? Well, our, our screening tests are good, but they're not perfect. So our screening tests, you know, maybe are at 97%. But let's just say hypothetically that we had a 99% uh, accurate screening test. Um, and let's say we had that. 
So that that would mean that if we are recommending a 99% accurate screening test for the general population, then out of 100,000 people, um, we would uh, screen um, you know, a, a good proportion of that population and get a bunch of false positive results for a very few number of true pancreatic cancers. And I think that that's the important thing to realize is that um, this is a numbers game. And the only way you can screen a very large population is that if that screening test is 99.9999% accurate, which we do not have. So those people who are at slightly increased risk, they don't benefit from screening. And that risk benefit ratio is, is not going to help them. You know, they're going to be put through unnecessary procedures and we, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. However, if let's say somebody comes to me and they have two first degree relatives with pancreatic cancer, well, now their lifetime risk is 8%. And in that situation, we can help you. And in that situation, you do benefit from that yearly MRI. And there is a higher probability in that pro population that if that MRI does show something, that that something actually represents a real disease as opposed to a false positive finding. So um, I think really the sort of take home message is, is that these high-risk screening programs are highly involved. Um, you really do need to get consultation from your physician to you know, get advice on whether this is something that would benefit you or your family. And um, it's better to err on the side of caution and ask, but most people will not be candidates for high-risk programs. But if they are, then those high risk programs will dramatically benefit them. And and um, you know what I say to folks, you know who are uh, you know in in our high risk program is, you know if you have a lifetime risk of eight percent, okay, there's still a ninety two percent chance you will not develop pancreatic cancer. So overwhelmingly, you will not develop pancreatic cancer. But this is a life insurance policy for you because if you do develop it then we can catch it early and we can extend your life. And the data really supports that. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think there's a really a, a true benefit in, 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 in that subgroup of patients to, to, to help. Also, however, I also wanna put that in perspective for you. So let's say somebody gets screened for pancreatic cancer and they're in a high risk program and they have an 8% lifetime risk. Well, is that high or low? Well. It's helpful to that individual, but if you have an average woman who has a risk of 12.5% to develop breast cancer, that individual's risk of developing pancreatic cancer, even though they're considered high risk, is lower than the average woman's risk of developing breast cancer. So that kind of puts things in perspective for you. It's, it's, a, rare, uh, it's a rare entity to find a positive finding in these situations, but you do have to find the population where it helps. And on a population level, um, these high-risk screenings save lives and um, and uh, really, I think, benefit our community. Um, and with that, uh, I know I've thrown a lot of information, um, you know, uh, in in this presentation. And I want to open it up for questions. Awesome. Um, thank you so much again for this. I think, you know, for me, you highlighted. You know, I know you kept on highlighting about how complicated it is. I kind of keep on going to how scary it is, right? For that person and for people that have concerns about it. Um, I know you focused a lot today on the genetic testing. And I, I, in the beginning of the presentation, I really didn't understand why there was limitations. I think you did a good job of explaining the value of the genetic testing. But my question is, is AI helping us move closer to being able to make that that kind of more of a universal um, type of test. I know that there's been a lot of advances there. Have you seen any uh, improvements in terms of the genetic testing uh, that maybe will make it a little bit more applicable to, you know, as a general test? So there are tests on the market that are trying to look at uh, you know, comprehensively look at cancer risk. So sort of the holy grail here would be you go to your primary care doctor, you get a blood test every year, and that blood test tells you that you have A, B, or C risk and, uh, you know, gives you that assessment. And there is a lot of work uh, in combination with, uh, you know, uh, both genetics, 
artificial intelligence and um, that is being put into those type of tests. They're still not, uh, you know, mainstream at this point. There are opportunities, but the the data does not really support their broad use. However, I do think that in 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 the next ten years we will see that come into the mainstream as AI helps us find the, uh, you know, AI is very, very good at finding patterns. And really what um, what we're looking for in genetics is patterns and being able to analyze uh, very, very large amounts of data. And so I do think AI is going to have a big impact in uh, how, uh, you know, these VUSs get interpreted and eventually get uh, converted into either benign findings or high risk findings um, or pathogenic findings. And, and so um, I think to answer your question, um, uh, there, I, I think there will be dramatic improvements. Uh, we are seeing an exponential growth in our understanding of genetics. Uh, I think we know more uh, now than we did say two years ago. And, you know, by the way, pancreatic cancer screening was not even available two years ago. It was only under study and only in 2022 was where the data came out where this makes sense to apply this to the general population, um, um, you know, to, to be able to offer it as a modality of entry into a high risk program. So I just want to be, uh, I, you know, I want to be very clear about the fact that, um, the, the sophistication of this is growing um, and, you know, the the ability for us to be able to find things earlier is improving, um, but we do have ways to go. Awesome. And I'll follow it up with one, one more question and then we can open it up to the group. I think, you know, people in general, I, I know a lot of folks that would sooner get an oil change for their car than they would um, get some kind of screening for their for their own personal health. What's the kind of the general message that you would want to say to a person like that in, in terms of how they manage their own health care and, and maybe just hit on a few important things that everyone should be doing to, you know, make, make sure that they actually uh, stay healthy and, and have the opportunity to perhaps have an early intervention if something does come up? Well, you know, it's the old adage, you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. So we are able to catch a lot of things very early where, um, you know, a small procedure, you know, uh, can potentially, you know, alter an entire course of somebody's life. And I think people don't, um, you know, they don't really take care of certain things until, um, you know, it's too late. And I think one of the messages here is, you know, you, if you have an extensive family history of cancer, it is, it is, you have an onus on you to, to check, because if you check, you can prevent. And if you can prevent, then you can extend the life, not only of yourself, but of your whole family. Remember, these are familial diseases. You need to understand how, the entire family can be impacted. And, you know, oftentimes what we see is, you know, uh, families that have multiple different types of cancer, but it is one gene that's causing all of those types of cancers. And so understanding that one gene and knowing that that is in your family, um, I mean, can impact everybody that you love. And so it's, it's, uh, I think it's a very important thing to uh, keep our community healthy to, um, you know, be, you know, become educated about this topic and um, to, um, you know, to be very proactive with your own health. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's open it up to the group for some questions. All right. Uh, there you go, Carrie. Let's get you unmuted. Good morning. I saw my hand was hidden, so that's why I went like this because uh, it's yellow. Um, anyway, thank you for your um Thank you for speaking. Um, I was looking forward to this today. I I have the I have breast cancer in my family. My sister uh, got it at age thirty. My half sister, um, they said it was from too many hormones. Uh, you know, she got through it. Thank God. Uh, two years later, she got leukemia. Yeah. Um, so she's been through the ringer. But since then, you know, I am getting tested, I was tested for the BRCA gene. I do not have it, thank God. But on a yearly basis, um, I do go and, you know, I get the tests. I get, um, not to be too 
keep telling you TMI, but, um, you know, the mammography, the MRIs, um, sometimes biopsies, you know, and, and I'm a true believer if you catch it early enough, you know, you might be, you know, it's not guaranteed, I, I know, but, um, you know, it's a scary thing to go through, but with, you know, everything that we have out there to help us uh, diagnose or to prevent, you know, why not? And I know Center State is a, a very well-known um, organization. And, uh, you know, um, anyway, I just wanted to say that, but if anybody's hesitating, I have friends that hesitate. <clears throat> and um, I never thought I'd be going through this stuff. Nobody ever thinks anything. But, um, I, you know, I, I beg them. I'm like, you found this. You have to know early diagnosis. Um, you know, sometimes we don't want to do those things, but we have to. I do see um, that you have some sort of um, screening. Somebody, MDY chemo 01, sent that, and it's the, for the head, neck, and thyroid. I do have thyroid, Hashimoto mm -hmm. uh, hypothyroidism, so I would assume, is that phone number yours, so I can call to get more information on that? Yeah, I think Mary, we'll get to Mary. Yeah, Mary Ellen's got some information on screening, so okay. we can share that. And I don't know if the doctor wanted to comment as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, sorry. what was the what was the type of doctor that you are again? I missed that name. So I'm I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon. So I I tr in my clinical practice I treat uh, essentially all cancers of the liver, pancreas, and then also deal with a lot of abdominal tumors and and um, you know uh, essentially abdominal tumors. You know for you, it's, uh, uh, you know it's a, just a fancy word for pancreas and liver. Uh, yeah. But um, to, what, I, what I would say is, um, you know, in, in, in the setting of, you know, like breast cancer and leukemia, uh, you know, one of the important things, and I, 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 you know, I just want to reiterate your point, how important it is to get screened. You know, one of the big opportunities in that setting is to, um, you know, really look at a, is there a genetic link there? And then the other thing is, is there are opportunities with hormonal therapy for chemo prevention in breast cancer. So if people have an overwhelming risk, but let's say they, um, you know, it's not high enough where uh, a mastectomy would be indicated, let's say, one of the things that's an opportunity is to get uh, chemo prevention. So we have in, in, uh, in our breast center, we have a uh, high risk nurse, nurse practitioner who's uh, a, uh, you know, trained um, and kind of board certified in a specialized form of genetic testing applicable to breast and how it, uh, you know, and, and how high risk breast cancer works. Um, and, uh, you know, I would highly suggest that, that, that may be somebody that you, you should, uh, speak to because there may be opportunities either for chemo prevention, um, uh, additional screening and, and, and really obtaining a better understanding of where this whole process originated from both in you and your, and your family. Thank you. Uh, just one more quick question, kind of on a personal, I have somebody in my life who has chronic pancreatitis for about eight years now, and a lot of doctors just shrug their shoulders. Um, do you, uh, are you, do you work in that field or just? Yes. That would so, be um, chronic pancreatitis. Uh, one of the important things there to understand is that, uh, you have to figure out what the sort of origin of the chronic pancreatitis is. Uh, you know, sometimes it is from common causes, but sometimes it can be from genetic causes. In addition, chronic pancreatitis is a predisposing risk factor for pancreatic cancer. And, um, so we, uh, you know, there may be opportunities there to observe that pancreas depending on the, on the context. So I would, you know, recommend that that individual see a pancreatic specialist and, 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 um, you know, uh, get that assessed. And you're a pancreatic specialist. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. So much, Mike. Awesome. Th thanks, Carrie. Um, Mary Ellen, did you want to go just kind of quickly talk about the screening that you have, and then we can continue with questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have monthly screenings. We work close with the cancer center. This particular one, head, neck, and thyroid, um, we catch a lot of positives here. Um, which we can refer after that, um, you know, make a referral. Uh, we we do get a lot of people for this screen and we happen to have openings. It's next week. So um, the number's there if you want to. I can share with Howard maybe the flyer for the year, you know, the awesome. whole year schedule. That might be helpful. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, 
big into prevention here at the Health Awareness Center. Um, I actually, uh, just another personal story real quick. I have a cousin that was going to Sloan um, and he was kind of delaying. He was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and thyroid cancer at the same time. Um, he did have surgery, but he delayed a little bit and it ended up being metastatic. So um, I remember talking, um, Dr. Itzkovich actually looked over his stuff and said, just tell him to take some kind of action. But I, I felt like not to put Sloan down, but it was kind of delayed just when he could get in for surgery. Um, quick, once you're diagnosed, and Dr. Itzkovich can um, definitely speak on this, is taking some kind of action after you're diagnosed quickly. Um, his sister lives in Freehold and is actually coming for a thyroid uh, biopsy next week with um, Center State. And, uh, you know, again, he had um, family history. His dad, you know, died very young. So, I mean, I've been passionate for a long time about wellness and prevention. And as many people um, in, in this department, really, um, we do a lot of screenings to kind of you know, diagnose early and to try to catch things early. So um, I'll send that to you, Howard. And uh, I don't know if Dr. Iskovich wants to speak anything about the thyroid screening. Yeah, I, I would just, you know, I just want to add, you know, we, um, you know, we're quite privileged uh, at Center State. We have, you know, a national authority on uh, uh, thyroid cancer, Dr. Alex Schifrin here, who's one of our physicians. And um, I think, you know, really, I mean, you're really getting treated by one of the best in the world in terms of, you know, thyroid disease. I think, you know, just in general, uh, action is very important. I think that what happens in, you know, a lot of major centers is, you know, your appointments get pushed out two or three weeks, and then uh, another week here, another week there. And then, you know, you realize you're a month and a half out or two and a half months out until treatments initiated and 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 things are still moving along. I mean one of the things that we really pride ourselves on here is access. Um, it is a uh, you know m one of my biggest priorities as the you know sort of a, my medical director hat on to try to see if we can get every cancer diagnosis in uh, you know preferably you know preferably within a week. Um, because I really do believe that, um, you know, timing matters and um, having gone through, um, you know, cancer in my own family, I can tell you, uh, you know, not only on the professional level, but on the personal level, that waiting period plays a big impact, you know, psychologically on the person, the angst of not knowing what's going to happen. So it's it's very important that we get into prevention programs and not ignore problems if they're, if, you know, if, if they're clearly visible. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, you know, that that's the whole purpose of uh, a presentation like this, especially because it is, you know, a, an awareness month. Um, so uh, Mary Ellen, definitely getting those screening dates out, I think is, is something that we absolutely 100% want to do. And that is, you know, that's where I think our missions actually align in terms of education and wellness, right? So we definitely want to share that and uh, I'm happy to do that. Let's uh, see if maybe we can take uh, one or two more questions if there are any. Anyone have a, a question? I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, so uh, I actually had thyroid cancer and had my thyroid removed in March of 20, actually 2001, it was that long ago. Um, and, um, I didn't have any family history. I, nothing was in, you know, it, I didn't ex obviously who expects to get any kind of cancer. Um, but, um, there's, um, is there anything I can do to make sure it doesn't come back? I mean, my thyroid's gone, but how do I know that nothing else can happen because I had thyroid cancer and it was years ago. So, um, well, I, I would say that, you know, given the fact that there's, you know, there, there's a, you know, now it's been, you know, sounds like over 20 years since you've had it. I mean, in all likelihood, it was cured from the original operation, but that doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't prevent you from having to, you know, do your yearly mammos and get your colonoscopy and do all of those other preventive uh, measures. Um, generally speaking, thyroid cancer in and of itself, uh, unless there are particular markers on it, um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily genetically test everybody. Um, however, um, 
I would speak to, I don't know if you, you follow with an endocrinologist or your primary care doctor, um, you know, they can look at that in, in a little bit more detail and see if you'd be eligible for something. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Any one more question? If anyone Yeah, just one more question, How for, for the doctor. Um, my husband's dad died at 55 years old of pancreatic cancer. So that's always something that worried me. I mean, I've, your statistics make me feel a lot better. But for this pre-screening, let's just say his uh, general practitioner says, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Is there a way for insurance to cover this at all, this, this testing? Or do you find yourself, you saying that this is mostly out of pocket? So uh, at this point, given the change in 2022 guidelines, we see almost 100% coverage with insurances. Like in, in the past, I'd have to send letters to the insurance companies. But now uh, it, it's, it, it's universally covered as long as you're following what's called the CAPS Consortium Guidelines. So, and uh, the American Gastrointestinal Association also put out uh, recommendations on this now. So, um, because the societies have formal recommendations, the insurance companies essentially have to follow those. So, um, it's really not a problem if, you know, with, with one first degree relative with pancreatic cancer, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to screen. But one of the things that I would recommend in, in, in the setting of your husband is to be genetically tested. And if he if he doesn't have anything, you know, on in terms of his genetic testing, he's at slightly increased risk, but it's not worth, you know, doing that yearly MRI. But if we do find something on the genetic testing, well, in that situation, then, um, you know, then you would initiate testing and it would be fully covered. And you said that that was just like blood work, correct? The genetic test testing? Okay. That's yeah. awesome to hear. Thank you so much. You were really informative and kind of eased my mind a little bit here. <laughs> awesome. And, and I agree 100%. And I, I want to thank the doctor for coming on today. This was very informative. I actually learned a lot from this. And there are certain things that I need to take care of myself personally. And you, this was a great reminder for me as well. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, we appreciate your time uh, today. Um, and uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, like I said uh, earlier, you know, we are, um, you know, we at Central State, um, we have a very, you know, large program now with a, you know, a broad, uh, you know, a broad array of subspecialists to take care of a variety of these problems. And uh, we're always happy to help and, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, you know, take a look at our website if this is something of your concern and certainly speak to your primary care doctor to see if this is something you'd be eligible for. Awesome.